Peace be with you. Welcome back, brothers and sisters. Welcome to Jesus via Mary. The best, surest, and the quickest way to the sacred heart of Jesus is through his mother, the Blessed Virgin, the Immaculate Conception. She's our mother, too. Mary, our mother. Let's begin with a prayer. Remember, O most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was it known that any one who fled to your protection, implored your help, or sought your intercession was left unaided. Inspired with this confidence, we fly unto you, O Virgin of Virgins, our Mother. To you do we come, before you we stand, sinful and sorrowful. O Mother of the Word incarnate, Despise not my petitions, but in your mercy, hear and answer them. Amen. Well, here we are once again, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us. We have a lot of good information for you today. We're less than one week away from Lent. Lent begins next Wednesday, and all of us Catholics will be getting ashes placed on our forehead on Wednesday. The ashes are placed in the form of a cross and we do this for two reasons it's a personal act of remembrance and it's also a witness for others the ashes come from the burnt palms from last year's Passion Sunday celebration or Palm Sunday celebration which begins Holy Week so these ashes bring us back to the passion death and resurrection of Jesus On this first day of Lent, we begin a journey of renewal. This is on Ash Wednesday. The journey is from death to life. This is a joyful season. We make sacrifices in order to try to let God reform our desiring. But this is also a time for God to be generous to us. When the ashes are placed on our foreheads by the priest or the Eucharistic minister, They say one of two formulas to help us remember who we are and the mission to which we are sent. The first formula is, Remember, man, that thou art dust, and unto dust thou shalt return. The other one is, Turn away from sin and be faithful to the gospel. We're reminded that we are creatures and that our lives were given to us, but we're also reminded that our lasting home is in eternity with God. This, the world, is not our lasting home. We are reminded that our call is to turn away from sin and to believe the good news of our salvation in Jesus. This is a joyous joyous and joyful reminder. It challenges us for sure, but reminds us of why we want to turn from sin. Finally, we wear our ashes as a sign. It is not a boastful sign through which we're trying to say, look at me and see how holy I am. No, 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 it's much more. It's more like we're saying, I'm willing to wear this sign in the world and say that I've been reminded of where I come from and where I'm going. And I've heard the call to turn away from a life of sin and to give my life to living the gospel of Jesus. Here's a reading from the book of Joel, chapter 2. Yet even now, says the Lord, return to me with your whole heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. Rend your hearts, not your garments, and return to the Lord your God. For gracious and merciful is he, slow to anger, rich in kindness, and relenting in punishment. The day before Ash Wednesday is called Shrove Tuesday. The word shrove is an old English word, old, 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 goes back many centuries, and it really means to cleanse. In other words, to go to confession and get your sins forgiven before Lent starts. As far as the holy face is concerned, we only have two images in the entire world which are true, truly pictures of Jesus. One is on the Shroud of Turin, which is authentic, make no mistake about that and we'll be talking more about the Shroud as we get further into Lent. The other image is on the veil of St. Veronica. You may recall that 
when our Lord was on the way of the cross, Veronica stepped forward and handed the veil to Jesus and wiped his face, and he rewarded her by leaving his image on the veil. There are many ways to show devotion to the holy face, which was buffeted and punched, and his nose was uh, pushed out of joint, although it was not broken, and it was spit upon, and who knows what all else. You can go online and get a lot of information about the Holy Face. Just type in Holy Face or HolyFace.com or HolyFace.org. There are many beautiful prayers that we can say to make reparation to Jesus for the abuse of His Holy Face. Here's one of them. Eternal Father, I offer Thee the adorable face of Thy beloved Son for the honor and glory of Thy name, for the conversion of sinners and for the salvation of of the dying. And here's another. Almighty and eternal God, look upon the face of thy Son Jesus. We present it to thee with confidence to implore thy pardon. The all merciful advocate opens his mouth to plead our cause. Hearken to his cries. Behold his tears, O God, and through his infinite merits, hearken to him when he intercedes for us poor, miserable sinners. Amen. Here's another, and this is my favorite. Adorable face of Jesus, my only love, my light, and my life. Grant that I may know, love, and serve Thee alone, that I may live with Thee, of Thee, by Thee, and for Thee. Amen. You know, during Lent we'll be uh, fasting, praying, making sacrifices, and this is a good time to remember the five first Saturdays devotion that Our Lady requested when she spoke to the children at Fatima. Uh, The Saturday following this program, two days from now, is the first Saturday, so this is a great time to start. What is the devotion all about? Well, during her July apparition, this is in 1917, at Fatima, Our Lady said to Lucia, I shall come to ask that on the first Saturday of every month communions of reparation be made in atonement for the sins of the world. And although she made no further mention of this devotion while appearing at Fatima, later on December 10th, 1925, that's about eight years later, our Blessed Mother again appeared to Lucia, who was a nun at that time, It was there that Our Lady completed her request for the five first Saturday devotion and gave her great promise. Appearing with the Queen of Heaven in that apparition was the infant Jesus who said to Lucia, Have pity on the heart of your most holy mother. It is covered with thorns with which ungrateful men pierce it at every moment, and there is no one to remove them with an act of reparation. Then Our Lady spoke. See, my daughter, my heart encircled by thorns with which ungrateful men pierce it at every moment by their blasphemies and ingratitude. Do you, at least, strive to console me. Tell them that I promise to assist at the hour of death with the graces necessary for salvation all those who, in order to make reparation to me, on the first Saturday of five consecutive months, go to confession, receive Holy Communion, say five decades of the Rosary, and keep me company for a quarter hour meditating on the mysteries of the Rosary. The elements of this devotion, therefore, consist in the following four points, all of which must be offered in reparation to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. One should make this intention before carrying out Our Lady's requests. A renewal of the actual intention at the time is best. However, if such an intention is made now, it will fulfill the requirements. If, for instance, the actual intention is forgotten at the time of confession. Now, as far as going to confession, this can be before the first Saturday or afterwards. 
provided that Holy Communion be received in the state of grace. Holy Communion. Before receiving Holy Communion, it is likewise necessary to offer it in reparation to Our Lady. This Communion will be accepted on the following Sunday for just reasons, if the priest allows it. For instance, if we have someone has to work on Saturday and just can't possibly get to Mass, they could do it the next day on Sunday, but they have to get permission for, from their priest in order for it to count as reparation to the Blessed Mother. The Rosary is a vocal prayer. We've touched on this, and we'll talk on it a lot more in the future, about the life, death, and resurrection of our Lord. A lot of people feel that the 15 minutes or so that it takes to pray the Rosary fulfills the next requirement, which is a 15-minute meditation. But no, no, no. The 15 meditation is addition to and over above the praying of the Rosary. Well, that's a good time to start right now. We, one thing we want to remember, Our Lady once said, When somebody prays the Rosary... She, Mary, is holding our hand. So I like to think, I will hold Mary's hand and be not afraid, and I will pray the rosary. During our last program, you may recall that we read a meditation from the first joyful mystery of the rosary, the Annunciation, which is when the angel Gabriel came to Mary and asked her to be the mother of the Son of God. And these were the actual thoughts and remembrances of Mary. We're going to do another now. This is called the Visitation, when Our Lady went to visit her cousin Elizabeth. I went quickly to my cousin Elizabeth's home after receiving the angel's message. Though the journey was quite arduous, I knew in my heart, upon seeing her, I would receive confirmation of all the angel had spoken to me. Indeed, upon my arrival, she told me the babe in her womb had jumped for joy as I approached. So aged was she, but yet with child. I had no doubt she had been given a great gift from God. Empowered by the Holy Spirit, I spoke from my heart, speaking of generations yet to come, and of the great miracle God was bringing to earth through the power of the Holy Spirit. My dear people, in praying this mystery, I would ask that you reflect upon so great a God that He can answer all prayers. For it is through God all things are possible. Perfect your prayer lives and come to Him with expectant faith. He will always answer in His way, in His time. Praise be to Jesus. And now Our Lady's thoughts and remembrances on the Nativity, the birth of Christ. It is impossible to describe in terms of earth the joy and awe of that night. All things leading up to this joyous event caused anguish. The trip so long and arduous, the separation from our families, the lack of proper dwell dwelling upon our arrival in Bethlehem. Yet when my eyes beheld my infant son's countenance, so fresh from heaven, none of the trials could I remember. He was all holiness. In his presence our meager surroundings faded from sight. I felt the presence of heaven on earth. He could have chosen to come into the world in the palace of a king, sharing all the comforts of the world. Yet this was not his choice, for he was not of this world. His kingdom was with his Father in heaven. As he grew, he never chose the world or its pleasures, but kept his eyes ever on his Father's kingdom. So I ask all who pray this mystery of my rosary, pray for this same spirit of detachment. This grace, indeed, is vital to salvation. Those who worship the things of this poor world cannot truly say my son is first in their lives. In his omniscience, 
He knows the hearts of all men and shall not welcome into his kingdom those who place him last in their hearts. Praise be to Jesus. Now we're going to read from the fourth mystery, the presentation. When I recall this mystery, the presentation of my infant son in the temple, I have mixed emotions. I recall the many days of prayer and sacrifice leading up to it. Joseph and I wanted our son to be blessed in a most special way. Then we set out, so that according to Jewish custom, we would arrive in the temple when he was of proper age. We took with us a simple offering of some birds. He was blessed, having been presented to the priest. Several times while we were on the steps of the holy temple, a man of some years approached us, his name being Simeon. At one point he asked to hold my beloved son, and so doing spoke most prophetically. He thanked God for sparing him for that moment, then told me that my soul, too, would be pierced with a sword. Indeed, I knew at once of what he spoke, for my cross throughout the rest of my life was the knowledge of Jesus' future. I knew he would suffer a tortuous death, one that I would witness. I knew that this darkest hour would be brightened by his resurrection. At once I was saddened and peaceful, knowing he whom I held in my arms would redeem mankind. I held all these things in my heart, pondering them as I cared for my divine son. Joseph and I set out for home, both of us reflecting quietly the events of the day. Later Joseph spoke to me softly of what Simeon had spoken, hoping to calm my fears. But I, with the wisdom of God given to me, knew the day was coming when I would indeed suffer as too would my son. It was the cross I was to bear for thirty-three years. And now the last of the joyful mysteries, my friends, it's the finding of Jesus in the temple. When Jesus was twelve years of age, Joseph and I took him to Jerusalem for a holy day of celebration. We were not alone, but traveled with a large number of family and friends. It was on the way home I started to search for my beloved son among the group with whom we were traveling. At first I felt sure I would discover him tucked away in a corner, asleep, or speaking of God the Father to his cousins and friends. As the hours wore on, I grew more and more distraught. Joseph decided we should return at once to Jerusalem, fearing he had been left behind. Now it was many days' journey to return. The heat was overwhelming and added greatly to our burden. As we again approached Jerusalem, Joseph suggested that we search the temple first, as this was the place most pleasing to my son. It was late afternoon. The shadows were already growing long. As we mounted the huge stone steps of the holy temple, I felt a great sense of peace. Even from the top steps we could hear his voice echoing through the great stone chambers. Joseph found him standing in the midst of several learned men, speaking profoundly on writings of a prophet from ages past. My heart was flooded with joy as he placed his youthful hand in mine once again. We told him of the great concern he had caused us, notwithstanding the long trip back. He asked if we did not know he must be about his father's business. I turned this over and over in my heart for many years to come. Yes, he was about his father's business, but it was not yet time. He and his great and overpowering love of God could not wait to share with others his infinite knowledge. It was an act of love that took place that day, not an act of disobedience. Jesus returned with Joseph and myself to our humble home. 
He was never disobedient to us, but humble in all things. He grew under our watchful eyes to maturity. This is so typical of the meditations that are available to us when we pray the rosary and the type of meditations that make the beautiful background music for the prayers that we say. The words of God and of Mary permeate our mind and our heart. Speaking of words, I'd like to talk to you for a moment about the first word that our Lord said when he was on the cross, after he had been nailed to the cross and it was erected. In those days when crucifixion was fairly frequent, the prisoners, the condemned, the crucified, started to curse because they were in such pain, agony, excruciating pain. Jesus was even more so, but we'll go into that as we get into Lent. But all of the crucified were in pain, and they would curse and curse. Sometimes they would curse the ones who had condemned them, the ones who had nailed them, or tied them, as the case might be, to the cross. Sometimes they would even curse their own mother for having given birth to them. It would sometimes get so bad that the soldiers would cut out their tongue just to keep them quiet. It's not inconceivable that the Pharisees expected Jesus to do the same thing. That would have given them the opportunity then to say, Now, here's this holy man who says to turn your other cheek and forgive your enemy and listen how he curses. But he did not curse. The first words out of his mouth were, Father, Forgive them, for they know not what they do. This is extreme humility. There's Jesus hanging on the cross, nailed to the cross. A friend has betrayed him, Judas. His own religious leaders have handed him over to the enemy, and he has been condemned to death. One of his closest companions has denied he even knows him. That's Peter. His long-term disciples have deserted him. Strangers drive nails into his body, and crowds who do not care about his love or his Father are making a joke of his suffering. And Jesus forgives them all. Forgives Judas and the high priest and Pilate and Peter. He forgives the followers who had no courage the soldiers who perform the crucifixion, and the people who seek to humiliate him in the very act of their ridicule. Jesus does not wait for them to say they are sorry, to come to him with contrition, to prove they have changed. He asks his Father's forgiveness for them, even as they are putting him to death, even though no one shows a hint of remorse. This is such a staggering, unheard of, inconceivable act of forgiveness that it's easy to overlook the rest of what Jesus says. We are lost in a place between awe and honor at the nobility of one who forgives in this way. We feel awe at the largeness of such a spirit and horror that we may be asked to do the same, to forgive with such generosity. We feel sure that we can't. It is hard enough to forgive those who regret the injury they have caused, to forgive those who do not seek our forgiveness or show concern for our suffering seems to be asking too much. To follow the example of Jesus, we have to hear all of what he says. First of all, he does not say, I forgive you. He says, Father, forgive them. What we in our humanity cannot dream of doing, God in full divinity can and will. We can pray for God's forgiveness for our enemies. We can ask God to go beyond the limitations of the human heart and do what God does best, 
forgive a sinful creation. This is an important lesson to learn from Jesus because the culture in which we live tells a much different story. The ancient code of an eye for an eye is very much alive and well. If people cause harm, people ought to pay. Restitution may be a form of justice, but the forgiveness Jesus teaches goes beyond justice to the new covenant of mercy. If God exacted from us pure justice, no one would be saved, as the disciples once fearfully understood. But the forgiveness Jesus preached and offered, even to the last hour on the cross, requires no eye-for-an-eye restitution. It is God's free gift. It cannot be bought or earned or deserved. We don't need to wait for restoration to forgive those who wrong us. We don't have to wait for healing to come or for our emotions to catch up to our Christian duty. We can ask God to forgive our enemies for us as Jesus did. Only then can real healing begin. For when we hold no one bound who sins against us, neither are we held bound by the desire for vengeance. Father, forgive them. It's a staggering proposition, but the reason Jesus offers is even more stunning. They do not know what they are doing. What gets sinners off the hook is not our goodness, our contrition, our well-meaning intentions, or our pledge to do better. It's our ignorance that makes us eligible for forgiveness. A truly humbling thought. The seven capital sins are all rooted in ignorance. We are proud because we do not see how small and fallible we are. We are greedy because we think things can bring us happiness. We are lazy because we have grain enough stored in the barn for tomorrow, forgetting that tomorrow may not come. We envy others, not seeing how jealousy poisons our ability to love. We harbor anger and forget the mandate to seek reconciliation. We see others through the prism of lust and distort them into mere objects for our own satisfaction. We approach food or drink or other pleasures gluttonously, forgetting our responsibility to those who do not have what they need to survive. Humility resolves all conflict, forgives every enemy, and lives in peace with everyone. In humiliation, there is shame. But in humility, great dignity. Yes, Jesus was humble. And now we're going to say a prayer. It's called Prayer Before a Crucifix, as Jesus looks down on us from the cross. Look down upon me, good and gentle Jesus, while before thy face I humbly kneel. And with burning soul, pray and beseech thee to fix deep in my heart lively sentiments of faith, hope, and charity, true contrition for my sins, and a firm purpose of amendment, while I contemplate with great love and tender pity thy five wounds, pondering over them within me, and calling to mind the words which David thy prophet said of thee, my Jesus, They have pierced my hands and my feet. They have numbered all my bones. We're about out of time, my friends. Don't forget to send for your book, Flame of Love. All you have to do is go online and type in flameoflove.us and fill in your name and address, and a free book will be sent to you. We hope that you will join us next time. We have a lot more information for you. And we want to be with you. Take care now. And God bless.